Revelation U, God, and a KJV Bible chapter 3 to 5. Three warnings to the last three churches are given in this chapter. Sardis only has a few believers left and is in danger of losing faith in God completely. Philadelphia is faithful, but they become believers only at the end of the tribulation period, which means that most of their work for God will be in the millennial reign. The Laodiceans have completely lost faith in God and will be thrown into the lake of fire if they do not repent. Although all of Israel shall be saved, Romans 11 verse 26, at the end of the tribulation period many just barely make it into the kingdom, as seen by the five virgins who trim their lamps when the midnight cry is given, see Matthew 25 verse 510. The reason God allows the tribulation period to go on if it does is, so these three churches are saved. This is why God ends the great tribulation period when he does, Matthew 24 verse 22. The warnings of Revelation 3, then, are especially important for believing Israel to heed, lest they not have any oil in their lamps, for when the Lord Jesus Christ comes to bring them into the kingdom. 3, colon 1, the seven spirits of God, 3, colon 1, are mentioned four times in scripture, 1, colon 4, 3, colon 1, 4, colon 5, and 5, colon 6. From these references, we know that the Lord Jesus Christ has the seven spirits, three colon one, they are before God's throne, one colon four, they look like seven lamps of fire burning, four colon five, and they are sent forth into all the earth, five colon six. Since the Lord Jesus Christ has them, they are not considered members of the Godhead. My guess is that they are the seven spirits of, one, the Lord, two, wisdom, three, understanding, four, counsel, five, might, six, knowledge, and seven, fear of the Lord, as mentioned in Isaiah 11 verse 2. Whatever they are, the seven spirits of God act as a buffer between God and the churches since the churches do not receive the atonement until after the tribulation period is over, Acts 3 verses 19 to 21. The seven spirits, then, keep God from destroying the churches during the tribulation period. This is why they look like fire burning. If so, this shows that God has many forces at work to keep his wrath from being poured out upon man, which makes sense since God's wrath is already revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, Romans 1 verse 18. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, 120. The seven stars or angels minister God's letters of instruction, found in Revelation 2-3, to to the seven churches, so that the churches can endure unto the end of the tribulation period and be saved. Sardis's problem is that many of them have abandoned faith in God in favor of apostate Israel's religious system. The warning to them is that God is watching them. Therefore, they had better repent and return to faith in God if they are going to enter God's eternal kingdom on earth. Sardis is a lot like churches today. Sardis, at one time, had faith in God's promises to Israel under the law covenant. Now, they have abandoned faith in God in favor of the lusts of the flesh, accomplished through religion. Since they are religious, they have a name that they live, but the truth is that they are dead spiritually. 3 colon 2 Sardis only has a remnant of faith in God's law covenant with them. Since they are an apostate religion, the things of faith that do remain are ready to die. 3 colon 2 Their only hope, then, is to be watchful by comparing what they hear with God's word rightly divided, kicking out the doctrine that is false. This is what Jesus referred to as watch and pray, Matthew 26 verse 41. They should also strengthen the things that remain, 3 colon 2, which would be faith in God's word, by reading God's word rightly divided and by allowing the Holy Spirit to teach sound doctrine to them so that they will be able to stand against the attacks of the apostate, religious system of Israel. If they do not do this, they will end up completely abandoning faith in God and be lost forever. 3 colon 3 Sardis needs to change their mind, i.e., repent, 
about following apostate Israel's religion. They then need to hold fast to faith in God's word to them. Matthew 24 verse 43 says that Jesus will come upon Satan's house, steal the people who belong to Satan, and judge them into the lake of fire. If he comes on Sardis as a thief, 3 colon 3, it means that they are part of Satan's house, and not a part of God's house. Therefore, they need to get back into God's house, by having faith in God's law covenant with them. Otherwise, God will throw them into the lake of fire, rather than bringing them into his kingdom. 3 colon 4 In spite of the apostate religion being a large part of the church at Sardis, there are still a few people who have not defiled their garments. Gar garments, in Israel's program, stand for righteousness, see 19 colon 8. Their own righteousness is as filthy rags, Isaiah 64 verse 6. If Sardis has faith in God, they will be given white robes by God, 611. They are made white in the blood of the Lamb, 714. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Isaiah 1 verse 18. Therefore, not defiling their garments, 3 colon 4, means that this is the believing remnant in Sardis. They have faith in God's promise to give them eternal life in the kingdom, rather than trying to earn it themselves by following the religion of apostate Israel and the Antichrist. Therefore, they will receive God's imputed righteousness, which means they will receive white robes. She should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. 19, 8, dot. They will walk with the Lord, which tells us that the curse of sin will be lifted, and they will walk with God in paradise on earth, just like Adam walked with God, Genesis 3 verse 8. The difference between saved Israel and Adam, though, is that saved Israel is worthy to walk with God, because they have had faith in God's promises under the law covenant, instead of believing Satan's promises via the Antichrist and apostate Israel in the tribulation period. Therefore, they will walk with God forever, while Adam only walked with God until he sinned. 3 colon 5 When reading the letters to the seven churches, the reward to the overcomer always matches what he overcame. In this case, Sardis has overcome self-righteousness. Therefore, they are given the white robes, washed in the blood of the Lamb, of God's imputed righteousness. Their names not being blotted out of the book of life, then, must also be in line with overcoming self-righteousness. A lot is made of the book of life in churchianity. What is it? Who is in it? How are names added or blotted out? 13 colon 8 and 17 colon 8 tell us that the names in the book of life are there from the foundation of the world. 3 colon 5 and 22 19 talk about people's names being blotted out of the book of life. 2015 says that those not written in the book of life will be cast into the lake of fire. 2127 says that only those written in the book of life may enter New Jerusalem. John 1 verse 9 says that Jesus is the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Putting all these verses together, I conclude that, when God made the earth, he also made the book of life, which contains the name of every single person who would ever live on this earth. At the end of each person's life, if he has not had the blood of Jesus Christ atone for his sins by having faith in whatever God has told him to believe, his name is blotted out from the book of life, since he will receive the wages of his sin, which is death, instead of the gift of eternal life, Romans 6 verse 23. If he believes the gospel, his name remains in the book of life. As a side note, the body of Christ was created before the foundation of the world, Ephesians 1 verse 4, and not from the foundation of the world, as the book of life was, 17 colon 8. Some people use this distinction to say that the book of life only pertains to Israel's program. However, the body of Christ also has life in Christ, and Paul does mention that his fellow laborers are in the book of life, Philippians 4 verse 3. Therefore, it makes sense that all believers 
not just those in Israel's program, would have their names in the Book of Life. In the context of the people in Sardis, since apostate Israel is in their midst, them being overcomers means that they had faith in God's promises to them, such that they confessed that Jesus is the Christ, having come in the flesh already, 1 John 4 verses 2 to 3. And, because they were willing to confess Jesus before men, the Lord will not blot their names out of the book of life. Instead, he will confess his name before my Father. Just as Jesus promised to do in Matthew 10 verse 32, so that they will enter eternal life. Note that Jesus also says that he will confess his name before his angels. Matthew 18 verse 10 says that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. People use this verse to say that we have guardian angels. If we really have guardian angels, then why do some godly people die prematurely? However, it appears that his angels refers to the ones that will get orders from believing Israel in God's kingdom, since they will be judging angels at that time, 1 Corinthians 6 verse 3. This is the case, confessing a believer's name before his father gives him eternal life in the kingdom, and confessing the believer's name before his angels lets the angels know which ones are assigned to serve him in God's kingdom. Hebrews 1 verse 14 says of the angels, Are they not all ministering spirits, sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? Therefore, rather than being guardian angels that protect you from physical harm while living this temporal life, your angels are really those who will serve you in eternity as you rule your realm, heavenly places for the body of Christ and the earth for Israel. 3, 6 again, understanding Jesus' letter to the churches requires faith in God so that the Holy Spirit will give them the spiritual understanding. This faith is the ear to hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches, 3, 6. 3, 7 of the seven letters to the churches. This is the most difficult one to understand. Everything in this letter seems to be geared toward the millennial reign. As such, my guess is that the church in Philadelphia is established extremely late in the tribulation period. They sat on the fence for a long time, not taking the mark or bowing down to the image of the beast, but not having faith in God either. Then, just before the tribulation period ends, they make the choice to believe the gospel of the kingdom. As such, their work is primarily in the millennial reign, giving the gospel and the Mosaic law to the Gentiles, Matthew 28 verses 19 to 20, as priests of God, Exodus 19, colon 5-6. All they need to do before then is to hold fast which thou hast, 311, which is their faith in God. They need to remember that the Lord is holy and true, 3, 7, and he will bring them into the kingdom. From Isaiah 22 verses 20 to 22, we can surmise that the key of the house of David refers to governmental rule over a territory. Isaiah 9 verses 6 to 7 says that the Lord Jesus Christ will be the governmental ruler over the whole earth. Therefore, in Revelation 3 verse 7, when the Lord says he has the key of David, it means that, as the ruler over the whole earth in the millennial reign, Jesus Christ has the authority to give governmental rule to some people and take governmental rule away from others, and no man can overturn his decision. That is what he that openeth, and no man shutteth, and shutteth, and no man openeth, 3 colon 7, means. We see this in practice in the parable in Luke 19 verses 12 to 27. There, one man receives authority over ten cities for being faithful, while another man loses what was given unto him. Therefore, the church at Philadelphia needs to continue to have faith in God's promises. 4. If they side with the Antichrist, the Lord will take away the governmental rule that he has for them in the millennial kingdom. 3. 8. Because they are new believers, the Philadelphian church only has a little strength. However, because they have kept God's word and have not denied his name, he has set before them an open door. 
This open door is in relation to Jesus having the key of David, 3, 7. He does not use this key until his second coming, which is still future at the writing of this letter. Therefore, the Lord is telling the Philadelphians to continue in their works of having faith in God's promises to them under the law covenant. If they do this, they will rule over the Gentiles with Christ in the millennial kingdom. The open door is them being able to go to the Gentiles with the gospel of the kingdom and the Mosaic law and the millennial reign and see many Gentiles saved. Because they have kept the Lord's word, and have not denied his name, the Lord knows that the Philadelphians will be faithful to do the same among the Gentiles during the millennial reign. 3, 9 In 3, 9, as in 2, 9, the Lord references people of the synagogue of Satan. They are physical Jews, but they do not have faith in God, which means that they are not spiritual Jews. They are like the Pharisees of Jesus' day, who said Abraham is our father, John 8, 39. Yet, because they did not do the works of Abraham, John 8, 39, i.e., believe God, they are really of their true father, the devil, John 8, verse 44. And, so, the fake Jews of the synagogue of Satan are apostate Israel. They doubt the Babylonian religious system as being from God when it is not because they are aligned with the Antichrist, apostate Israel will be killed at Jesus' second coming. Therefore, they will not be in the millennial reign. Also, as an angel will later mention in Revelation 19.10 and 22.9, worship belongs only to God and not to man. Therefore, the synagogue of Satan coming and worshipping before the feet of the Philadelphians must refer to them worshipping the Lord Jesus Christ at the time when every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord, Philippians 2 verses 10 to 11, which is at the great white throne judgment. They will be bowing before the Philadelphians' feet because they are ruling with Jesus Christ. So, in the tribulation period, people will worship the Antichrist, bowing at the feet of apostate Israel, because they are ruling with the Antichrist. Similarly, apostate Israel will worship the Lord Jesus Christ, bowing at the feet of the Philadelphians, because they are ruling with Jesus Christ. Therefore, the Lord mentions this to the Philadelphian church so that they will be willing to hold that fast which thou hast, 3.11, knowing that role reversal will take place at Jesus' second coming. During the tribulation period, apostate Israel is killing and persecuting the little flock, saying that the little flock is going against God. However, once Jesus takes over, then apostate Israel will know that Jesus loves believers, 3 9, which is in stark contrast to what apostate Israel says about the little flock of Israel during the tribulation period. 3.10 Since Philadelphia still must hold fast what they have, 3.11, and overcome, 3.12, keeping them from the hour of temptation, 3.10, must not refer to taking them out of the tribulation period. Since the focus is on them working for Christ in the millennial reign, I believe that the hour of temptation, 3.10, refers to the 45 days or so of darkness between the end of the tribulation period and Jesus' second coming. This 45-day period is calculated by subtracting the 1,290 days of Daniel 12 verse 11 from the 1,335 days of Daniel 12 verse 12. During that time, believing Israel will wait in darkness for Jesus to come as a thief in the night, 2 Peter 3 verse 10. They must survive this hour of temptation to be saved at Jesus' second coming. Jesus promises to be with them during that time so that they will be saved. Matthew 28 verse 20 3 11, Since the Philadelphians are saved toward the end of the tribulation period, the Lord tells them that he will come quickly. Their job is to hold fast to faith in God. That way, no one will take their crown, and they will reign with Christ forever in God's kingdom on earth. 3.12 He shall go no more out. 3.12 tells us what the Lord means when he says he will make the Philadelphians a pillar in the temple of my God, 312.
The pillar is a symbol of standing firm, which means that they will forever be true to and belong to the Lord. It does not mean that, physically speaking, they will never leave the temple, because they will go to the Gentiles with the gospel of the kingdom and with the Mosaic law, as evidenced by the open door that is set before them, 3 8. Therefore, it is only spiritually speaking that the church at Philadelphia will go no more out, 3.12, from the temple of the Lord. Having God's name written upon them indicates possession. Therefore, as they go out as a kingdom of priests, Exodus 19 verses 5 to 6 and Isaiah 61 verse 6, to the Gentiles in the millennial reign, the Gentiles will see the name of God written on them and know that they belong to God. Therefore, the Gentiles will go with saved Israel to Jerusalem to learn of God, Zechariah 8 verses 22 to 23. Since they are going out as a kingdom of priests, their new name is probably Holiness to the Lord, since that is what the high priest wore under the Old Covenant, Exodus 28 verse 36. The name of my God is the I Am, Exodus 3 verses 13 to 14. The name of the city of my God is given in this verse as New Jerusalem. Thus, they will be wearing holiness to the Lord, the I Am of New Jerusalem. In other words, they are God's ambassadors to the world. They show everyone that they represent the I Am of the New Jerusalem, and their name is holiness to the Lord to bring glory to the Lord rather than to themselves. Jesus wants to make it clear that the new Jerusalem cometh down out of heaven from my God, 312. This happens after the millennial reign is over, 21, 1-2. Therefore, when the Antichrist proclaims in the tribulation period that he has brought about new Jerusalem, Israel should not believe it, just like they should not believe that the Christ is on earth during the tribulation period, because he will come down out of heaven. Just because the Antichrist attaches the name of New Jerusalem to his kingdom does not mean that he is in New Jerusalem. For example, today, the Mormons claim to represent Jesus Christ because they put his name in their church name, but they do not represent Jesus Christ because they preach a false gospel and follow a false book. 313 Again, it takes faith in God's promises to have the Holy Spirit to be able to get the spiritual meaning out of the epistles to the seven churches in Asia. 314 The Laodiceans are the worst of the seven churches. They are a completely unsaved church. As it stands, all of them will go to the lake of fire. As such, they first need to recognize Jesus as the Christ so that they stop following the Antichrist as the Christ. Therefore, Jesus calls himself the Amen 314, which means let it be so. In other words, as the Lord, whatever Jesus says is so. It is the truth. Laodicea needs to place their faith in what God has said to them in his word, trusting in Jesus as the Amen. Jesus is fully God and full man. As God, he is the Amen, as man, he is the faithful and true witness, 314, to himself being the Amen. He is faithful because, at his first coming, he fully obeyed everything God had for him to do. He is true, because, since he fully obeyed God, he was able to determine that God would fulfill his conditional promises to him. Therefore, Jesus is the witness that God's promises will come to pass, and Laodicea can rely upon his testimony because Jesus was both faithful and true to God. Jesus overcame Satan and received a place in the Father's throne. Therefore, the Laodiceans can rely upon the faithful and true witness of Jesus, such that they can be certain that they will also sit with Jesus in his throne, if they are overcomers of Satan. 2, 321. Jesus' resurrection in a glorified body is further evidence to the Laodiceans that they should have faith in God's promises to them under the law covenant. It is Jesus' glorified body that is in view as the beginning of the creation of God, 314. That holy thing. Luke 1 verse 35. Is saved Israel, and Jesus is the beginning of them, 
being the first fruits to be followed afterward by they that are Christ's at his coming. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 23 Therefore, Laodicea has the truth, the Amen, they have a faithful witness to the truth, and they have the evidence of the eternal reward awaiting them if they have faith in God's promises to them. All these together are more than enough for them to have faith in God, to have a place in God's kingdom. 3 colon 15 16 The idea of the Laodiceans being lukewarm, and not cold nor hot, means that they have a comfortable life, focused on the material, rather than on the spiritual. We see this from 317, where it says that they have need of nothing. Hot, cold, and lukewarm, then, are physical statuses used to represent spiritual statuses. If they were hot, they would need to find a cool place. If they were cold, they would need to find a warm place. But, because they are lukewarm, they are comfortable where they are spiritually. In other words, they see no need to have faith in God and to obey God. That is why God prefers they be either cold or hot. Rather, they will continue to follow the Antichrist and apostate Israel and go right into the lake of fire as a result. God does everything by his word. He spoke everything into existence in Genesis 1, and he will speak the wicked out of existence by the word coming out of his mouth. 19,13-15 In the tribulation period, God uses the little flock as his mouth to give life to the lost sheep of the house of Israel via the gospel. Because the Laodiceans have no faith in God, he will spew them out of his mouth, meaning that he will not use them to reach the lost sheep of the house of Israel because they are not saved themselves. Therefore, all that 3 colon 15 16 is saying is that the Laodiceans' works are of the flesh. They are not saved. Therefore, God cannot use them to advance his kingdom. It does not mean that we need to be on fire for God, hot, and give the devil the cold shoulder, cold, or whatever other metaphors people produce to rationalize the use of cold and hot here. An example of this condition is in the United States today. If you were a serial killer, you would be cold. If someone told you that you are a sinner and need to believe the gospel, you may believe it. Similarly, if you did heinous things to become a billionaire, you would be hot. If someone told you the gospel, you may believe it because you know of the awful things you did to get to the top. However, most people today are lukewarm, meaning that they try to do good to others, and they work hard to prosper materially. If you came to them with the gospel, they would not believe it, because they think they are okay on their own. It is this complacency that keeps the gospel from penetrating the soul and saving the person. Therefore, Jesus will spew them out of his mouth. 317 Now, we see why the Laodiceans are lukewarm. It is because they are rich in the goods of this world. Since the Antichrist controls the economic system such that the little flock is poor and the rich shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven, Matthew 19.23, the fact that the Laodiceans have material riches tells us that they are aligned with apostate Israel. Note that Jesus, in this verse, looks at the spiritual condition of the Laodiceans. They essay that they are rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, 317. This is true materially. However, spiritually this is not true. Spiritually, they are wretched and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked, 317. The word and is repeated between each of their characteristics to emphasize just how spiritually poor they really are. They are wretched because they are trusting in their own filthy rags righteousness, Isaiah 64 verse 6, rather than trusting in God's imputed righteousness. They are spiritually miserable because they are keeping the Holy Spirit from using their spirits to control the flesh so that they do not do the work of God's kingdom. Since the flesh is controlling the spirit, their spirits are miserable. Then, they are spiritually poor. In other words, they will not receive rewards in God's kingdom. They will not even make it into God's kingdom if they keep doing what they are doing. 
They are blind spiritually because they are allowing the Antichrist and apostate Israel to lead them. If they had faith in God's word rightly divided, they would have the light of God's word, Psalm 119 verse 105, to guide them in the valley of the shadow of death, Psalm 23 verse 4, which is the great tribulation period. Without the light of God's word to guide them through a dark world, the Laodiceans are spiritually blind. Finally, they are spiritually naked. They do not have white robes, 611, of righteousness, 19, colon 8. Instead, they have filthy rags of self-righteousness, Isaiah 64, verse 6, that God will destroy at the great white throne judgment. Therefore, the Laodiceans are in the opposite condition, spiritually, of their physical condition. This is the hallmark of the Great Tribulation period. The Antichrist and apostate Israel, because they have sold their souls to the devil, will look beautiful, happy, rich, enlightened, and clothed with riches to the world. However, spiritually, they will be wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Unfortunately, the spiritual condition of the church at Laodicea is just like the world today. I hope this indicates that the rapture will take place soon. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. 2220. 318. Because of this, Jesus counsels the Laodiceans to turn their condition around. Note that Jesus tells them to buy of me. 318. Isaiah 55 verse 1 says, Come ye, buy, and eat, yeah, come, buy wine and milk, without money and without price. Instead of going to the Antichrist for physical food, they should come to the Lord and buy spiritual food. They are unable to change the spiritual condition around themselves. They need to have faith in God's word rightly divided. They will then receive God's imputed righteousness. Gold tried in the fire. 318 has to do with rewards in God's kingdom. Their having faith in God's word is how they buy this gold tried in the fire. Along with their rewards in the kingdom comes white raiment, 318, which is indicative of God's righteousness given to them, 19, colon 8. They are currently naked because of their lack of faith in God, which shows that the church at Laodicea is currently not saved. The way they anoint their eyes with eye salve is by believing God's word. It is the Holy Spirit who gives the understanding of Scripture, 1 Corinthians 2 verses 9 to 16. God pours out His Spirit upon believers in the last days of Israel's program, Acts 2 verses 16 to 18. He says that the Holy Ghost shall teach them all things, John 14 verse 26. The Holy Spirit is represented by oil in the Bible, Exodus 29 verse 7, 1 Samuel 16 13. Therefore, this I salve that the Laodiceans need to use to see the truth of God's word is the Holy Spirit. If they do not allow the Holy Spirit to teach them the mysteries of the kingdom, they will continue to be blind, which means they will continue to be duped by apostate Israel, such that they will be cast into the lake of fire. Also, another part of the shame of the Laodiceans' nakedness is that they are naked in bed with the idolatrous, Babylonian, religious system, propagated by the Antichrist and by apostate Israel. The little flock can see the shame of their nakedness by recognizing the religious idolatry that the church at Laodicea is participating in. The shame of thy nakedness will also appear to people in the Millennial Kingdom as they look down into hell upon the carcasses of men that have transgressed against God, and they shall be an abhorring unto all flesh, Isaiah 66 verse 24. 3193 15 18 contains some harsh words that are hard for the Laodiceans to accept, especially since they believe that they are rich and have need of nothing, 317. God tells them to spend eternity with him, rather than being in the lake of fire with Satan. Therefore, he gives them a rebuke in that he scolds them for their unbelief. And he gives them chastening in that he will not use. 
them as his mouthpiece, 316, to reach the lost sheep of the house of Israel with the gospel of the kingdom, unless they are zealous and repent. For whom the Lord loveth he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth, Hebrews 12 verse 6, dot. Repenting means to change their mind. Right now, the Laodiceans' mind is focused on the things of the world. They need to have faith in God's word rightly divided and shift their focus to God's coming eternal kingdom. 320 Today, people use this verse to say that the gospel is to invite Jesus into your heart. The gospel is never this in any part of any dispensation. Rather, this verse serves as a warning to the Laodiceans. James 5 verse 9 says that the judge standeth before the door. 1 Peter 4 verse 5 says that the Lord is already ready to judge the quick and the dead. Isaiah 3 verse 13 says that the Lord standeth up to plead and standeth to judge the people. Therefore, 320 is a warning to the Laodiceans to repent now, because the Lord's second coming will take place soon. He comes through that door as the judge, and, as it stands now, he will judge the Laodiceans into the lake of fire, if they do not repent, change their minds, and put themselves back under God's law covenant with Israel. The reason the imagery of a door is used is because, when Jesus comes to the earth, he comes to the sheepfold of the house of Israel. In that house, he finds that thieves and robbers have entered the sheepfold by climbing up some other way, other than by the door, John 10 verse 1. Therefore, when Jesus comes to Israel, he first takes away apostate Israel into judgment, see Luke 17 verses 34 to 37. Then, he knocks on the door of the sheepfold. The sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and letteth them out, John 10 verse 3. He then gathers the lambs with his arm and carries them in his bosom and shall gently lead those that are with young, Isaiah 40 verse 11. Jesus leads them to his father's house, where he has a place prepared for them, John 14 verses 2 to 3, because he will marry them as his bride, 21 colon 2, 9. The purpose of Jesus' second coming is to marry his bride, which is faithful Israel, but he must first judge apostate Israel. Jewish custom was for the bride to be in the room and then have the bridegroom come into that room and consummate the marriage. For example, when Jacob was to marry Rachel, he judged improperly and consummated the marriage with Leah when he thought it was Rachel, Genesis 29 verses 23 to 25. Later, he married Rachel and consummated the marriage with her. Jesus, when he enters the building, which is the land of Israel, at his second coming, will judge properly that apostate Israel is not his bride. Therefore, he will cast her out and throw her into the lake of fire. Thus, his first action at his second coming is to judge the apostate nation of Israel. His second action will be to marry his true bride, which is the little flock of Israel. That is what is meant by his coming in and supping with those who believe, 320. The SUP peeing Jesus does with believing Israel happens at the marriage SUP of the Lamb, 19, colon 9. John 14 verse 23 makes it clearer by saying that Jesus and the Father will come unto the little flock of Israel and make our abode with him. Matthew 12 verse 29 alludes to the judgment part of this by saying that Jesus will bind Satan and then spoil his goods. Jesus bound Satan at the cross, Colossians 2 verses 14 to 15. At his second coming, Jesus will come as a thief in the night, 2 Peter 3 verse 10, and spoil Satan's goods by taking apostate Israel into judgment. This, then, clears the house so that he can marry believing Israel and dwell with her forever. Therefore, 320 is a warning of impending judgment for Laodicea, but it is also a promise of blessing and reward for those who have faith in God's word to them. It is up to the Laodiceans to have faith in God, which means they will open the door and dwell with God forever. Or they can continue in unbelief, leave the door closed, 
and then be judged into the lake of fire when God opens the door at his second coming. The choice is theirs. Therefore, saying that this verse says that you need to invite Jesus into your heart is a gross perversion of the truth. It shows the ugly pride of man in doing so. If Jesus knocks on your heart's door to come in, he is a beggar. He pleads with you to come into your heart, like your heart is some great place. No. This is not the case. God never begs. It is you, as a filthy, dirty, rotten sinner, that should come to him, smite your own breast, and say, God be merciful to me a sinner, Luke 18 verse 13. Churchianity has it backwards. They say to God, I thank thee, that I am not as other men are, Luke 18 verse 11. Since you begged me to, Jesus, I will let you into my heart. What a perversion! Instead, Jesus knocks on the door of the sheepfold of Israel to deliver the lawful captive, Isaiah 49, 24-25, from the hand of him that was stronger than he, Jeremiah 31 verse 11. This is the powerful, redeeming God of 320, not the weak, begging God of churchianity. 321 and 314, Jesus told the Laodiceans that they need to trust in him as the Amen, meaning that, what he says, will happen. He can also be trusted as the man, who was faithful to God, which makes him a true witness that God's promises will come to pass for the faithful. As the overcomer of Satan, Jesus was given a throne by the Father and is set down in his Father's throne, 321. In other words, the Father is above all, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 28, and the Son is beneath the Father within the Father's throne. Now, the Laodiceans have the opportunity to serve the Son as the Son had with the Father. If the Laodiceans have faith in God and reject what apostate Israel and the Antichrist are telling them, then they will also be overcomers. Then, the Son will give them a position within His throne, just like the Father gave the Son a position within His throne. Since the Laodiceans are impressed by the riches and power of the Antichrist, they should be even more desirous of a position in God's kingdom, since God's kingdom is much greater and will last forever. 322 Without having the Holy Spirit to guide them into God's truth, people, in the tribulation period, will read chapters 2-3 to and think that the Babylonian religious system of the Antichrist is what God wants them to follow. True believers in God's promises to them, however, will see these chapters as warnings against, and not support for, Babylon and the Antichrist. Seeing the truth, rather than Satan's lies, is only possible by having the ear of faith to hear the Spirit of God's instructions to the churches in these chapters. For before seeing all the bad stuff that will happen in the tribulation period, John sees the governmental structure in the kingdom of heaven as it will be for all eternity. He sees all power concentrated in the Lord Jesus Christ. He sees the twelve rulers in God's kingdom on earth and the twelve rulers in God's kingdom in heaven, the twenty-four elders, as they lead all of mankind in giving glory and honor to the Lord. He also sees four seraphim around God's throne, maintaining its holiness. The end result is that God receives pleasure for all eternity from mankind, who voluntarily serve the Lord. Therefore, John sees the happy conclusion first, so that he will see the necessity of the tribulation period events. Only by these events will save Israel will have their happy conclusion in God's eternal kingdom on earth. For colon 1 in chapters 2-3, to John wrote down the warnings and the promises to the seven churches in Asia, which are to strengthen them to endure unto the end of the tribulation period. Now, John will see the things which must be hereafter, for, colon 1. These are the events of the tribulation period. Note that these things must be hereafter. God does not want to pour out his wrath upon Israel, but he must do so in order to purify Israel. Malachi 3 verses 2 to 4, so that they will have faith in God to enter the kingdom. Without the events of the tribulation period, Israel would continue in their unbelief, 
as they have from the beginning, and be lost forever in their sins. Since the Jews require a sign, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 22, God gives them the signs of the tribulation period. Today, since the Greeks seek after wisdom, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 22, God gives us the hidden wisdom of God in the dispensation of grace, 1 Corinthians 2 verse 7. Starting in chapter 4, God will now give the signs of the tribulation period to Israel so that they may be saved and enter God's kingdom. Note also that the voice that John hears is as it were of a trumpet talking with me, 4, colon 1. In 110, John also heard a great voice, as of a trumpet, and that voice belonged to the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, the one, talking to John in 4, colon 1, is the Lord Jesus Christ. 4, colon 2, no man can see God and live, Exodus 33, verse 20. This is because God cannot be around sinful flesh or else his holiness would be corrupted. Therefore, John must leave his flesh behind and be in the spirit, for, colon 2, in heaven for this vision. 5, colon 6 identifies the one sitting on the throne as the Lamb, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. 4, colon 3, note the rainbow around God's throne. We also see the rainbow around God's throne in Ezekiel 1 verse 28. The rainbow is God's promise not to ever destroy the earth again with a flood, Genesis 9 verses 13 to 15. Thus, the rainbow around his throne reminds him of this promise, and our seeing the bow after a storm gives us a little glimpse into the throne room of heaven. Also, note that the word like appears many times in Revelation to describe the things that John sees. This tells us the reason God created the heaven and the earth the way he did was so that we would have an idea of what some of the things look like in the third heaven. This is why Romans 1 verse 20 says, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. 4, colon 4, who are the 24 elders? By rightly dividing the word of truth, we recognize that God is reconciling the earth back to himself in Genesis, Acts, and Hebrews, revelation through the nation of Israel. Jesus said in Matthew 19 verse 28 that the 12 apostles will sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel in God's kingdom on earth, as further evidence. John calls himself the elder in 2 John 1 and 3 John 1. Deuteronomy 32 verse 8 says that God's kingdom on earth is divided into 12 regions, one for each tribe of Israel. We also know that God is reconciling the heaven back to himself today in Romans, Philemon through the church, the body of Christ. Ephesians 1 verses 20 to 21 and Colossians 1 verse 16 speak of the governmental structure in heaven. Amos 9 verse 6 says that God buildeth his stories in the heaven. It makes sense that God would also divide heaven into 12 governmental regions, just like he did with the earth. Since the 24 elders sit on thrones around the Lord Jesus Christ's throne, they must be the 12 rulers under Christ on the earth, these would be the 12 apostles and the twelve rulers under Christ in heaven for the mystery dispensation, we do not know who these twelve are. Their white raiment makes sense, since white raiment is given to the saints as righteousness, 19, colon 8. The crown of gold upon their heads probably shows their position of authority as elders, which makes sense, since Paul says that we strive for spiritual mastery in order to obtain an incorruptible crown, 1 Corinthians 9 verse 25, and that Paul would receive a crown of righteousness from the Lord, 2 Timothy 4 verse 8. For colon 5 the lightnings, coming out of the throne, are probably cherubim, as mentioned in Ezekiel 1. This is because Ezekiel 1 verse 14 says that the cherubim go back and forth as the appearance of a flash of lightning. Granted, Ezekiel 1 describes them as the four living creatures. However, Ezekiel 10 verses 19 to 22 says that they are cherubim. Thunderings, 4, colon 5, speak of God's judgment of the earth, which, in this phase of the day of the Lord, would be the tribulation period, 
John 12 verses 28 to 29 describes the voice of God as sounding like thunder. The voices would be God's word, which, if Israel has faith in, will keep them from being judged into the lake of fire. In order for Israel to enter the kingdom, the seven churches need angels to minister to them. These angels are the seven spirits of God mentioned here, who are sent to the churches with the instructions found in Revelation 2 to 3. They are described as being seven lamps of fire, for colon 5, because the way that God saves Israel is by the refiner's fire of the tribulation period. Only then are they an offering pleasant unto the Lord, Malachi 3 verses 2 to 4. In summary, lightnings are the cherubim, keeping God's throne holy, thunderings are God's pronouncement of judgment, voices are God's instructions to the faithful to avoid judgment, and the lamps of fire are the seven spirits or angels sent to administer trials and instructions to Israel so that they will believe God and enter his eternal kingdom on earth. For colon 6, the heaven and the earth that God created in Genesis 1 are in a container. We know this because John 1 verse 51, Acts 10 verse 11, and Revelation 19 verse 11 give us at least three times when the third heaven is opened. Therefore, the third heaven must be partitioned off from the heaven and the earth. The top of heaven and earth's container is the sea of glass that is before God's throne in the third heaven. The four beasts are seraphim, as we will explain in 4, colon 8. For colon 7 the four beasts are reminiscent of the four characteristics of Israel's Messiah, Jesus Christ, as found in the four Gospels. The lion is Israel's king, which is shown in Matthew. The calf is Israel's servant, which is shown in Mark. The man is Israel's perfect man, which is Jesus in Luke. The flying eagle is Israel's God, which is Jesus, shown in John. Therefore, the four beasts look like four creatures on earth so that we may understand the qualities that Jesus had to have in order to save us from our sins. You may be tempted to conclude that the four beasts are cherubim because their four characteristics are like the cherubim of Ezekiel 1.10. However, there are some significant differences. First, the cherubim in Ezekiel each have four faces, while each of the beasts is only like one of the creatures, not all four. In other words, each cherub has all four characteristics, but each beast only has one of the characteristics. Also, the cherubim have a face like an ox, instead of looking like a calf. We should also note that the four beasts are all beasts that look like beasts, but one of them has the face of a man for colon 7, rather than looking like a man. I do not know the significance of these differences. Since Satan is a cherub, Ezekiel 28 verse 14, he has wings. He has also transformed himself into an angel of light, 2 Corinthians 11 verse 14. Therefore, it is no coincidence that churchianity portrays angels with wings. This is Satan's way of getting man to make the things of God look like the things of Satan. For colon 8 now, we learn that the four beasts are seraphim. The way we know this is that we are told that the four beasts had each of them six wings about him. Seraphim are the only creatures in the Bible that are said to have six wings, Isaiah 6 verse 2. By contrast, cherubim only have four wings, Ezekiel 1, 6, 1021, and angels have no wings, but they look like men, Revelation 21 verse 17. Also, Genesis 19 verse 1 says that two angels came to Sodom, but the men of the city call them men in Genesis 19 verse 5. The seraphim declare, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, Isaiah 6, 3 just like they say, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was, and is, and is to come here, for colon 8. Their job is to protect God's throne from being marred by unholiness. This is why they have eyes before and behind, for colon 6, so that they can see everything that is going on. The only place in the Bible where seraphim are mentioned by name is in Isaiah 6. 
There, Isaiah sins by saying that he is a man of unclean lips, Isaiah 6, 5, and immediately a seraphim places a live coal on Isaiah's mouth to purchase sin, Isaiah 6 verses 6 to 7, and protect God's holiness. The reason that the seraphim declare three holies to God is to represent the three parts of the Godhead. Holy is God the Father, holy is God the Son, holy is God the Holy Ghost. All three, then, make up the Lord God Almighty, for, colon 8. Note how what they declared in Isaiah 6 verse 3 stops at calling him the Lord of hosts, but here, he is Lord God Almighty. This shows that the Lord Jesus Christ, as the Lord of hosts, has already won the victory over Satan and his forces in Revelation. Therefore, he is called God Almighty. In other words, Isaiah saw the Lord as the man of war, Exodus 15 verse 3, who could summon the host of heaven to win any battle with man that Israel would have. However, progressive revelation allows John to see that Jesus is God, and he is almighty, not just to defeat earthly foes, but also to spoil principalities and powers in heavenly places through the cross, Colossians 2 verses 14 to 15. The reason that the might or power of God is emphasized here is because it takes the power of God to execute his plan of the refining fire of the tribulation period so that all Israel will be saved. The fact that the seraphim rest not day and night for colon 8 shows two things. One, keeping God and his throne holy is a job that allows for no breaks. And two, no rest is needed in heavenly bodies, which shows that we will not need rest up there ourselves, especially as shown by the 24 elders in 4.10 not having any rest, since the 24 elders are humans in their glorified bodies, just like we will be. Yet, Hebrews 4 verse 9 says, There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. This shows that, although they do not sleep, being in the presence of God is a restful position. Jesus said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Matthew 11 verse 28. Strife and weariness come from doing your own labor. However, if you present your body as a living sacrifice to God, Romans 12 verse 1, and allow Christ to live in you, Galatians 2 verse 20, then you are not really working Christ is. All you are doing is walking in the good works that God before ordained for Christ to do through. You, Ephesians 2 verse 10. Therefore, Christ's eternal work through us translates into eternal rest for us. The phrase which was, and is, and is to come, that describes the Lord God Almighty here, was also used in 1 colon 8 to describe him. It simply means that God always exists, in the past, which was, in the present, and is, and in the future, and is to come. This contrasts with the Antichrist that was, and is not, and yet is, 17, colon 8. When the Antichrist is killed, he dies. When Jesus was killed, God the Son never died, therefore, he remained alive. You can think of Jesus' death like what happened in Daniel 3. There, the three Hebrew boys were thrown into a fiery furnace to die, but no harm came to them. Similarly, when Jesus died on a cross, he was thrown into the fires of hell, but no harm came to him, Psalm 1610, due to his holiness. For colon 9 the seraphim give glory and honor and thanks to the Lord Jesus Christ because his death on the cross defeated Satan and his forces in the heavenly realm. The thanks part is thank you, Lord, for making my job easy. Once Satan and his forces are removed from heaven midway through the tribulation period, 12 colon 7 9, the seraphim will not have to worry any more about keeping God and his throne from Satan's attacks. It is for this that they are thankful. For colon 10 11 now, the 24 elders are the 12 apostles, Matthias took Judas Iscariot's place, who will rule over the earth, and twelve people from the grace dispensation, who will rule over the heaven. They are redeemed man, who had faith in God and his word. 
Therefore, they fall down and worship Christ for giving them such high positions in his kingdom. They cast their crowns before the throne, for ten, to show their recognition of the Lord's authority over all, including themselves. They extol the Lord's worthiness, recognizing his total victory over Satan and his forces by living a perfect life and being the perfect, atoning sacrifice, making it possible for mankind to be reconciled back to God. The twenty-four elders say that the Lord should receive glory and honor and power for eleven, while the seraphim gave glory and honor and thanks to the Lord for colon nine. The reason the twenty-four elders mention power is because, as humans, they were under the curse of sin, being dead in their sins, Ephesians 2 verse 1, having no hope, Ephesians 2 12. When Christ rose from the dead, the Father set him far above all powers in heaven and earth, Ephesians 1 verses 20 to 21, and Christ, then, lifts all believers above the curse of sin. Therefore, the power is important for the elders, for they would be in the lake of fire without it. In this context, then, the all things that God created, for eleven, would be all his undefiled creation, which is primarily all those receiving their new bodies and positions in heaven and earth to worship and bring glory to the Lord forever. Anything of Satan and sin is not considered a thing because it is temporary, 2 Corinthians 4 verse 18, Matthew 24 verse 35. Only the eternal are things in God's view. God gets pleasure out of the voluntary service of mankind to him. Thus, primarily in view are the bride of Christ, Israel, in God's earthly kingdom, and the body of Christ, Gentiles, in God's heavenly kingdom. The bride and the body are created by God and bring him pleasure throughout all eternity. Since God is talking about people, both the past and the present tense are used here. They were created in that God created the corporate bride and body of Christ in time past, but they are created in the present because God is still filling the bride and the body with people who place their faith in what God has told them. 5. The tribulation period starts with the opening of the book with seven seals. This is how it starts in heaven. On the earth, it starts with the Antichrist making a seven-year covenant with Israel, Daniel 9.27. Dot. The result of the tribulation period is that Israel will be saved. Therefore, the tribulation period represents God's mercy upon Israel. Only Jesus Christ, the Lamb that was slain, is worthy to start the tribulation period, since it means the salvation of Israel. The Lamb's worthiness to start the tribulation period is the point of this chapter. Only He can redeem Israel and make them God's kings and priests, verses 9-10. to If He were not able to do so, no one could, which is why John wept much, before, before the Lamb was revealed as being able to save Israel, since he won the victory for them on the cross. 5 colon 1 As we will see in the coming chapters, this book of seven seals is the book of the tribulation period events, which is the fire that results in the purification of Israel. Each of the seven seals is a judgment of God. The seventh seal contains the seven trumpet judgments, and the seventh trumpet judgment contains the seven vile judgments. The one, sitting on the throne, is holding this book of judgments. The Ancient of Days, who is God, is sitting on the throne, Daniel 7 verse 9. We learned from Revelation 1 verses 13 to 16 that the Ancient of Days is God the Son. So, it is God the Son, sitting on the throne holding the book of judgment. It is weird that there are things written on the backside of the book. I do not know why that is the case. 5 colon 2 dash 4 opening this book means the greatest time of tribulation ever upon the earth. Yet, John weeps much because no one can open the book. John is not a sadist who wants to see blood and violence. Rather, he has been exiled to the Isle of Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ, 1 colon 9. 
he is tired of seeing Satan rule the world. In chapter 4, he saw God ruling over heaven. John understands that the tribulations contained in that book are necessary to bring in God's eternal kingdom on earth. If the book cannot be opened, Satan remains as the God of this world, 2 Corinthians 4 verse 4, because Israel will not be saved. This is why John weeps when no one can open the book. It means that Satan will retain control of the earth. Note that even God cannot open the book. It takes a man. There is so much of God's power concentrated in this book that it even takes a strong angel, 5 colon 2, just to ask the question of who is worthy to open the book. God produced the plan of redemption, but it took God, becoming man, to bring about the redemption of man. Similarly, God produced the trials of the tribulation period as the way to draw Israel to himself, so that they may be saved, yet it takes a man to execute judgment upon mankind. The man who opens the book must be worthy to open it. No man can judge man unless he is above that judgment himself. The sacrifices that the priests brought into the temple before God could not take away sin, Hebrews 10 verses 4 and 11, because of the imperfection of the man, Hebrews 9 verse 7, and the sacrifice, Hebrews 9 verses 13 to 14. Similarly, sinful man cannot even look on the book of judgment. Because of his imperfection, any man would be killed just by looking at the book. No man in heaven. 5 colon 3 is a reference to redeemed man in heaven. They cannot open the book because they have not received their glorified bodies yet. Therefore, they are not completely perfected yet. Men in earth are those still alive and the men under the earth are those in hell awaiting judgment. They certainly cannot open the book. Also note that not only can no one except Jesus open the book, but also no man is found who he can even look at the book. 5 colon 2 this shows how powerful God's word is, Hebrews 4 verse 12, and that it should be treated with the utmost respect. How dare modern translators change God's sacred word around? 5 colon 5, think of it this way. God is a just God. He cannot do anything unjust, or else he would sin and no longer be God. Since all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3 verse 23, and the wages of sin is death, Romans 6 verse 23, God's justice demands that people die for their sins. The book with seven seals is God's plan of mercy for the nation of Israel to be saved in the tribulation period. The problem is that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, Romans 1 18. How can the justice of God allow God to show mercy upon Israel? when they are subject to God's wrath for their unbelief. Jesus said, Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men, Matthew 12 verse 31. Then, in Acts 7, Stephen said, Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost, as your fathers did, so do ye, Acts 7 verse 51. Therefore, there appears to be no provision of forgiveness for Israel in their program. However, there is a provision. What God did was he divorced Israel in the wilderness under Moses, due to their unbelief. This is why God tells those people, Your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness, and all that were numbered of you, according to your whole number, from twenty years old and upward, which have murmured against me, doubtless ye shall not come into the land concerning which I swear to make you dwell therein, save Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun, Numbers 14, 29-30. Then, God turns right around and says, But your little ones, which ye said should be a prey, them will I bring in, and they shall know the land which ye have despised, Numbers 14, 31. What happens at this point is that Israel is divided into two groups of people, one, unbelieving Israel, and two, believing Israel. 
From then on, all unbelievers will be part of the generation of vipers that cannot escape the damnation of hell, Matthew 23 verse 33. All believers will be part of the generation of Jesus Christ, Matthew 1 verse 1, that will enter the promised land. This is seen in God's statement in Isaiah 50 verse 1, Thus saith the Lord, Where is the bill of your mother's divorcement, whom I have put away? Or which of my creditors is it to whom I have sold you? Behold, for your iniquities have ye you sold yourselves, and for your transgressions is your mother put away. In other words, unbelieving Israel is a whore for their unbelief, Ezekiel 23, and God put her away. But believing Israel is the virgin daughter of Zion, Lamentations 2 verse 13. Their sins have been washed white as snow by the blood of Christ, Isaiah 1 verse 18. Therefore, only Jesus Christ can open the book and bring believing Israel into God's eternal kingdom on earth. This is why, initially, no one can open the book with seven seals. Yet, the lion hath prevailed to open the book and to loosen the seven seals thereof, 5, colon 5. In other words, if God were to judge by himself, the mercy plan of the tribulation period could not be carried out. A mediator between God and man is needed. Now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. Galatians 3 verse 20. Therefore, the question of, who is worthy to open the book, and to loosen the seals thereof? 5 colon 2 is really the question, who is worthy to be the mediator between God and man to keep the wrath of God from being poured out on Israel? yet satisfy the justice of God in extending mercy to them, when it seems all provisions of mercy have been exhausted? The reason that Jesus can open the book is because he did no sin, 1 Peter 2 verse 22, and became the propitiation, or fully satisfying sacrifice, for man's sin, Romans 3 25. This makes him the only one qualified to be the mediator, Thus, he is the only one qualified to open the book with seven seals. For there is one God, and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. 1 Timothy 2 verse 5 For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin, Hebrews 4 15. In other words, Jesus Christ met the justice of God by taking on God's wrath for Israel. He also can offer God's righteousness to Israel because he was the propitiation for their sins. Therefore, mercy can be offered to Israel, yet again, through the opening of the Book of Seven Seals. Now, things get even more confusing here. First, one of the elders saith unto John, 5, 5. Well, John is one of the elders, since he is one of the twelve apostles. It is possible, then, that John, as the elder with full knowledge, answered his, as the man with partial knowledge, own question. The writer, John, has not taken his position as an elder yet, therefore, the writer does not understand now what is going on, although he will understand in the future, when he is sitting on a throne as an elder. Also, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, 5, 5, is there. This is Jesus, as prophesied in Genesis 49 verse 9. He's seen as a lion, because a lion is the king of the jungle, just like Jesus is the king of Israel. In fact, we just saw the lion characteristic in one of the seraphim in 4, 7. A lion roars a lot before devouring its prey as a warning to others to get out of its way. Similarly, by bringing about the judgment contained in the seven seals, Jesus spiritually roars against the Gentiles that they had better bless the Jews, or else they will be Jesus' prey at his second coming. Note that Jesus, in his capacity as a man, will take the book from the Ancient of Days 5, 7 and the Ancient of Days is Jesus as God. Therefore, Jesus takes the book from himself, much like John may have answered his own question. Jesus' characteristic as a man, here, is emphasized by the title, The Root of David, 5, 5, 
being ascribed to him, as Isaiah 11 shows the root of David being the Savior. Being David's root, then, means that he must be a man. It is as a man that Jesus prevailed over Satan to give him the authority to release judgment upon Israel to bring them to salvation. Only Jesus, as the perfect man and Israel's king, can open this book of judgment. 5 colon 6 note in 5 colon 5 that, from John's perspective in eternity as an elder, he saw Jesus as the lion who would bring judgment. However, from John's perspective as sinful man, in 5 colon 6, he saw Jesus as a slain lamb, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world, John 1 verse 29. This tells us that, at the marriage supper of the Lamb, when saved Israel eats Jesus' flesh and drinks his blood, John 6 verses 53 to 58, they are not committing a cannibalistic act. Rather, saved Israel will be eating the ultimate Passover lamb to atone for their sins. Jesus is whatever Israel needs them to be. He is the lion for an elder who is looking for God to reconcile the earth back to himself, and he is the lamb for a believer looking for the atoning sacrifice for his sins. Note that the slain lamb is in the midst of the throne. This means he must be holy, otherwise, the four seraphim, closely guarding the holiness of God and his throne, c4, colon 6-8, would not have let him in. Horns, in the Bible, represent kingdoms. The seven horns, for colon 6, then, represent the seven churches in Asia, written to in chapters 2 to 3. These belong to God's kingdom in the midst of the Antichrist ruling the world and Satan's kingdom. We are told that the seven eyes are the seven spirits of God, which are the seven angels over the seven churches. While the tribulation period is going on, it may seem like God has been defeated, but we know that he has a kingdom of seven churches and he has angels watching over them to keep them spiritually safe during the tribulation period. It is funny how, from man's perspective, the tribulation period shows that God is not around, and that Satan has won, given that the Antichrist is sitting in the temple, has declared himself to be God, 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 4, and no one seems to be able to stop him, 13 colon 6-8. Yet, Revelation 5 shows that the tribulation period is God's plan, and that the Lord Jesus Christ, as the one who opens the book with seven seals, is completely in control of what goes on. Thus, God is working all things out for Israel's good in the tribulation period, Romans 8 verse 28, even though the world will think Satan has won. Then again, this should not surprise us. After all, Satan thought he won by having Jesus crucified, but in so doing, Jesus won the victory over Satan. 5 colon 7 The Lion Takes the Book from the Ancient of Days The Lion is Jesus Christ as man, and the Ancient of Days is Jesus Christ as God. How does he take the book from himself? I do not know. It is a mystery how Jesus can be fully God and fully man in the first place. And there are many instances where Jesus said or did something that shows that he could operate independently as God and independently as man yet be both at the same time. For example, Jesus learned obedience by the things which he suffered. Hebrews 5 verse 8 Yet God cannot learn anything. Therefore, Jesus must be able, as man, to take the book from himself, as God. 5 colon 8 dash 10 Since the four beasts and the twenty-four elders worship the Lamb and the Lamb was slain, 5 colon 9, it is clear that the Lamb is the Lord Jesus Christ, John 1 verse 29. The prayers of the saints are so precious to the Lord that he keeps them in golden vials. Also, the tears that his saints have cried for all the tribulation that they suffer for God are kept by God in his bottle, Psalm 56 verse 8. This shows what God values. By contrast, man's bottles are usually filled with alcohol. These verses show that the tribulation saints can know, by faith, that God loves them and will see them through the tribulation period. 
Now, the tribulations, found in the book with seven seals, serve two purposes. One, to bring judgment upon those oppressing the tribulation saints, and two, to give the kingdom to the little flock of Israel. We see, from 6, 9-11, that the prayers of the saints are for God to bring judgment upon their oppressors. The new song of 5, 9-10 specifically applies to saved Israel. However, since the 24 elders sing it and half of them are part of the mystery dispensation, there is a second verse to this new song that the body of Christ sings. This second verse is not included here since John's revelation specifically relates to Israel's program. Those who do not rightly divide the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2.15, will read Thou hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people, and nation, 5, 9, and declare that this group must be both Jews and Gentiles since every nation is represented here. However, 5, 9 does not say that thou hast redeemed people from all nations, but it says that God has redeemed them out of every nation. The tribulation period is part of God's fifth cycle of chastisement against Israel, in which God promises to Scatter them among the heathen, Leviticus 26, 33. Therefore, when God redeems the little flock, he is redeeming Jews out of every kindred, and tongue, and people, and nation, 5, 9. Thus, when you read Matthew 24, verse 14, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come, do not think that this is for today. Rather, the gospel of the kingdom must be preached in all the world in the tribulation period because the lost sheep of the house of Israel are scattered throughout the entire world. It is only the lost sheep of the house of Israel that the believing remnant is sent to reach during the tribulation period, Matthew 10 verses 5 to 6, not the Gentiles. Once all Israel is saved, Romans 11 verse 26, in the millennial kingdom, Israel's job is to be a kingdom of priests, Exodus 19 verse 6 and Isaiah 61 verse 6, to the Gentiles, teaching them to obey the law, Matthew 28 colon 19 dash 20, 23 colon 2 dash 3, and Israel will be the Gentiles mediator between them and God. Then, for all eternity, they will rule on the earth over the Gentiles. This is what is meant by saying that God has made Israel kings and priests, and they shall reign on the earth, 510. Yes, 510 does say that they will reign on the earth, 510. This is a clear indication of a different message than what Paul preached. Paul said that God hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, Ephesians 1 verse 3. He further said that our conversation is in heaven, Philippians 3 verse 10. No one who takes his Bible literally could conclude that Paul's letters and the book of Revelation are written to the same audience, since Paul promised us heaven and John promises Israel the earth. Therefore, you are not a holy priesthood, 1 Peter 2 verse 5, Israel is. In 5 colon 8, I would say that the harps represent the saints praising God in song as seen in 14, colon 2-3 and 15, colon 2-3. Thus, the believing remnant of Israel sings, praises, and prays to God, the result of which is that they will reign on the earth as kings and priests of God. 511 Jesus opening of the Book of the Seven Seals is a huge event in Israel's program. It signals the beginning of the tribulation period, in which Israel will be saved and, afterward, enter into God's eternal kingdom on earth. Knowing this, all in heaven gather around for the opening of the book. This is an event that all of heaven has been waiting for since God called Israel to be his holy nation in Genesis 12, which was, at the time of this writing, about 4,000 years ago. This verse also tells us that there are at least 100 million angels on God's side, since 10,000 times 10,000 equals 100 million. 
The only other time that 10,000 times 10,000 is mentioned in scripture is enlisting the number of people who will be at the great white throne judgment, Daniel 7 verse 10, which makes you wonder if, the reason that God has so many angels, is for them to deal with the unbelievers. 5127 is the number of spiritual completions, and so we see the Lamb is worthy to receive seven things. Jesus is the Lamb that was slain 512 since god raised him up from the dead and made him above all powers he is the lion of the tribe of judah 5 colon 5 that is his power his riches in israel's program is receiving the gentiles as his inheritance psalm 2 verse 8 because he won the victory over satan jesus the man receives the wisdom to rule over both the jews and the gentiles his strength is the ability to defeat the Antichrist, the false prophet, Satan, and all of Satan's forces in order to bring in the kingdom. He then receives honor in bringing in the kingdom. Those under the new covenant in the kingdom give him glory, and he is blessed with an everlasting kingdom. All of these things are necessary in order to open the book. Remember the question in 5, 2, who is worthy to open the book and to loosen the seals thereof? The one who opens the book is bringing God's kingdom on earth about, since he is bringing about the salvation of Israel. Therefore, he must be worthy to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. 512. All of these relate to the kingdom and only the lamb that was slain is worthy. 5 colon 13 dash 14 4 is the number of creations which is why creation only lists four things that belong to the Lord Jesus Christ, blessing, and honor, and glory, and power. Even the animals are singing God's praises here. Who is missing? Man is missing. Every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear. Isaiah 45 verse 23 That Jesus Christ is Lord, Philippians 2 verse 11 but this does not happen with all of man until the great white throne judgment. We do see the 24 elders, who are men, fall down and worship the Lamb, but we do not see the rest of man yet, since judgments have not been given to them yet before the tribulation period starts. Also note the distinction in this verse between God the Son and Jesus. As God, He sits upon the throne. The Lamb is a reference to Jesus, the man. Yet, as the Lamb, he also sits upon the throne, because he earned his worthiness by living a perfect life. <laughs>